Uh, hi, uh, my name is Matt Crooks. This is the talk you're about to see. I hope it's the one you thought you were going to see. Um, and I'll anticipate uh, my most common question. Yes, the slides are online. There's a link right here from the session description. All right? So I've got lots of material, so I'll go a bit fast. I'm expecting that you'll be able to come back and look at the slides yourself later um, if there's anything that I uh, skipped over too fast. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the intersection of Drupal and Git and Agile. Uh, three popular buzzwords. Uh, let's see how to put them together. Um, uh, so that you can fork, merge, and commit with confidence. Um, this is me. My name is Matt Quirks. I work with Evolving Web. I've been using, as I usually say, I've been using Drupal since Pluto was a planet. Um, my username is MVC on Drupal.org, uh, Slack, etc. Um, my Twitter handle is just M MVC and then that number again. It's like, you know, Roman numerals. Anyways, whatever. It's there in the slide. Maybe you forget it. Um, yeah, I work with Evolving Web. Really quickly, some background. These are a couple of our clients. Um, one thing missing from the slide, we just finished a, a large project for Princeton University Press that so took uh, uh, most of my summer. Um, yeah, we're a, uh, a, a small Drupal agency based in uh, Montreal, uh, full service uh, Drupal shop. Uh, Git, who here knows what, uh, who here has, who here has used Git and feels the least familiar, comfortable with Git basics? I think that's basically everyone. Jigar, I know you have. It's my, my colleague here, I get to make fun of him. Um, this is not a Git 101 talk. Uh, you all put up your hand, so I guess you don't need that. If you, if you or someone you know does want to get a, a, a tutorial, there's a great one linked right here. Um, who here used, for at least the first year they used Git, kept a text file or a, or a sticky note or something with a list of five commands and just kept referring to it? Yeah? Who here still has that list? Yeah, exactly. Everyone does that which is, uh, as, as uh, the XKCD uh, cartoon pointed out. Um, I, I still have a list, so what I'm going to show you now is uh, some highlights from my own personal list. Git is confusing. I'm also not going to talk about the details of the Git data structure under the hood. Um, I know just a little bit about that, and it's not relevant. Uh, Agile. Who here uh, knows what Agile is, feels like they have the, the basic idea, the basic concepts? Okay, that's almost everyone, great. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about this either. Um, but yeah, it's a way to, for, there were a couple hands that didn't go up, so for those people, um, it's a way to take a clearly defined list of uh, user stories, which is like, as the content editor, I want to be able to log in in order to be able to update the front page. Um, so it's a way of listing the specifications for your site in a readable uh, fashion, a way to break them down that makes sense. Um, you take a set of these user stories, you turn this into tickets in an issue tracker. Um, you have a sprint, usually, usually two weeks long, um, in which you work on a bunch of those. At the end of that, you do a demonstration to the product owner, who will show it to the client, and who will say, yeah, that looks great, or no, you've got to still need to do some more work on this other one. Um, this, there's a scrum master, which is a fancy way of saying project manager, who will uh, uh, pick which tickets to work on in the next two week sprint, uh, they will have been put in order and weighted by how hard they are in collaboration, but in discussion with the client and the team respectively. And so you'll have this endless list of, of tasks that you want to work on. That's your backlog. And you'll get as far as, as you can through that uh, before you launch the site. I'm not going to talk more than that about Agile. There's a lot of resources online about that too. What we are going to talk about is how to use them together. Um, uh, so, in your issue tracker, uh, I've used, so issue trackers I've used have uh, usually been uh, Redmine or Jira. Anyone else use something different? No? Everyone's using one of those two ticket, those two systems? So your tickets always have a number. Um, uh, allow me to strongly suggest that you create a separate Git branch which has that number in it so that you know what Git branch actually is associated with what piece of, uh, what user story in your issue tracker. Um, you have, uh, so, so create, a, create a separate Git branch for each of those. 
uh, those changes should be um, uh, self-contained and should uh, um, update the database as needed uh, uh, and when they're deployed. Um, the, the, you need to document uh, how to deploy them in, the, in your issue tracking system. Uh, so, and they so should use, and they say, and they should uh, include whatever code is necessary to update the database or the configuration. So, um, to to step back a bit, your your Drupal your Drupal sites always consist of three things, right? You've got a, your code base, um, you've got your database, and you've got uh, user uploaded files. So, when I when you're adding functionality to the site, that will basically that will all that will usually affect the, the code base and sometimes the database. So um, one way to do this is to remember, oh yeah, after I deploy this, I've got to go click these five things on my website. And then you, somebody's going to forget something eventually, so that doesn't work. So the, uh, the next way to do it is to write down those five things you've got to go click after deployment. That also uh, leads to things getting dropped. So you should use, or yeah, another question. Who here is working in Drupal 7? And who here is working in Drupal 8? OK. Yeah, so in Drupal 7, this is a little more complex. Um, I, uh, I would strongly suggest that you use uh, update hooks, so hook update n. These are what, um, in a custom module somewhere, these are what modules use to update the, uh, the database schema or other things in the, uh, in the database layer. Um, when you run uh, um, update.php or drush updb, those are the functions that get run. So if you need to add a new block um, or uh, do some other database level changes, put that into code. Then you, can, then you have a deployment process which is, uh, which is committed to Git and which can be tested, which can be tested using um, continuous, uh, continuous uh, integration and, a, and an automated test if, you, if that's your process. But you've got, uh, you've got something better than a sticky note saying, oh yeah, when I deploy ticket 15, I gotta go click these five things. That'll never work. Um, in Drupal 8, this is much simpler thanks to the configuration management system. Anyone here using Drupal 8 already knows this, so this is more for the rest of you. But um, uh, configuration in Drupal 8 is saved to a series of YAML files, simple, very human readable text files. Uh, that, uh, there's a simple command to export and import those because the live state is in the database and then there's a version in code that you can uh, commit to Git. So all you need to do is export that from your dev instance. Uh, and then import that in your production server when you're ready to uh, deploy that. And those, those steps for um, testing your ticket and for, de and for deploying your ticket, um, uh, including URLs, sometimes screenshots, a description of the expected result, like before the live site was doing this, after this thing is deployed on your, dev on your test instance, you should see that it's doing this. All of that needs to be clearly documented in the um, uh, in your ticket tracker, like add extra fields. You can do that in almost any, um, in, in Jira or in Redmine. Uh, so when is all of this useful? I'm assuming that you're using something resembling an agile workflow, um, that you have, uh, you have a series of sprints and regular deployments. I'm assuming that, that this isn't just one person working on a website. You've got a team, a bunch of people who need to work together uh, uh, with one, some, some sort of project manager who will go then review the work of, their, of uh, your colleagues and decide whether they're approved and make sure things don't clash with each other. Um, uh, I'm assuming that you will do regular re uh, releases, so not just one big product launch, but at some point you're going to roll out changes to a site that's already live. Um, uh, so that means continuous integration and user acceptance testing. Uh, that might mean, has anyone here ever worked with a change approval board, sort of a large institution thing? Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to ask you if you like it because I, I already know the answer. They're, they're very painful, but it's something a large enterprise does to um, ensure that people from a variety of departments have reviewed the changes that uh, are coming up in a new deployment and make sure it doesn't interfect, uh, interfect, that's not even a word, it doesn't affect anything uh, uh, in their department. Um, like the, single, the person who ever manages the single sign-on thing or whatever. Um, I'm assuming that you will occasionally need to do a hotfix for an urgent problem uh, directly on the live site without wait waiting for your two-week sprint cycle because hotfixes, urgent crises, they happen. Um, and also, uh, a tricky one in Git, I'm assuming that once in a while you'll have a, a sprint in which you close, say, 10 tickets, 
And when doing user acceptance testing, you'll discover that one of them isn't quite ready to be deployed, and so you'll need to uh, remove that from the set of tickets that are about to be deployed, um, and then uh, keep working on it elsewhere in another branch. Uh, specific techniques for doing these, uh, I'm going to get to in later slides. So now let's talk about Drupal best practices. Um, so I already mentioned you've got code base, data, the code base, the database, and user contributed files. If I'm going to test the changes um, uh, that uh, that my colleague has worked on on a on a, on a copy of the site, uh, getting the, getting the code base is easy. I just type git pull like whatever branch they're working on. Um, I'm going to need to copy the database. I'm assuming everyone here is working on a site that has like a nightly backup um, of some sort and that you have a way to sync those backups down to your development environment. Um, if you're working with massive databases, then this gets tricky, but let's just assume it's some reasonable size that you can put on your laptop. Uh, so that leaves uh, um, the user contributed files, so all, everything in site's default files. What should you do with those? I allow me to strongly recommend the stage file proxy module. This is in very good shape for Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. So all you do is you configure it. There's one important piece of configuration, which is the URL of your production site. So you give it that URL. And then anytime you go to load an image on your dev site, so in your dev site, you have zero files when you start, when you spin up a new dev site. When you go to load a page, if there's five images, whenever it, it basically catches the uh, these attempts to load an image, the, these 404s, um, and then goes and fetches transparently the image from the production site, copies it down into your development site, because the image is on a public website already, by definition, uh, and just loads the ones you need. So if you've got, like, this, this site I'm working on for the Princeton University Press, there's like 17 gigs of images, but to test a specific function, I probably only need four of those images. So rather than syncing all those files down, this will just go load those, those four that I need. Uh, the module is intelligent enough to understand uh, image styles, uh, so it will figure out what the original image is, fetch that, and apply the image style rules locally, because those might be different than production. Um, you might need to load the page twice if, uh, to, to get them, and if there's an image style bit, it'll show up. And this is just dev, so that's good enough. Um, the stage file proxy uh, module, you can leave it enabled on prod because it's smart enough to know uh, if you set, the, you set the URL of the production site and then it's smart enough to, to see that that's the same as the URL of the, of the, of the instance of the site that, it's, it's currently, that, that you're currently using when you're on prod, and it just does nothing. It just, it just exits out instead of trying to handle any images. You can also set that to, use, uh, to null. And so it's, it does a no op on prod, and so you just leave it in place and run it on dev and stage. Um, the database. Uh, you can use... Um, uh, I've seen different processes for handling these, fetching these from your, uh, your nightly backups, but there's, uh, Drush gives you an SQL sync command in which you can use site aliases to go and fetch the database. It has a handy plug called dash dash sanitize. Uh, sanitize will wipe uh, user passwords and user email addresses uh, from the user table. Um, this is very useful it's to help make sure that you're not, uh, for example, spamming your users uh, with uh, test messages from your dev instance. If you've ever done that uh, and somebody yelled at you about that, you've probably learned your lesson. If you, if you haven't yet learned that the hard way, I'll, I'll just tell you right now, that's not a good thing to do. Uh, there are other ways to do that, to capture outgoing mail from your dev instance. For example, there's a really nice little utility, utility called Mailhog that just shows you a little web app where you get to see, it catches all the mail coming out of your dev site and just shows it to you in a little web app so you can go s and scroll through it and no mail leads to, uh, out into, to, to the actual users, but um, if one way or another, you have to make sure you're not emailing your users. Um, and then, as, I, as I've been mentioning earlier, if, you, um, uh, if deploying your change requires any touching the database in any way, then you need to write update hooks in Drupal 7 or, um, uh, or in Drupal 8 or uh, um, export those changes to uh, configuration man uh, management in uh, Drupal 8. Um, then uh, you can systematically test this deployment process and you don't need to um, uh, uh, list uh, manual deployment steps in a ticket. Uh, Drupal 7 specific practices. 
um, you should export any configuration you can to a feature. Um, you should, I would suggest grouping these into uh, so having one feature module that contains all the configuration um, uh, so content types, views, variables. For example, for the blog on your site, into one one uh, into one module. Um, there's then the uh, command drush features update all. Uh, will export from database to code. Revert all will take everything from code and bring it into the database. So that's what you'll run on production when you deploy. It. Um, you'll need to use you need to use the, uh, the features web UI to create new features. Uh, and here is a uh, handy little um, uh, uh, shell uh, uh, alias I have, uh, which will just list all of the features. So run this, and you'll see a list of all the features on your site which are different between the database and code. And so it'll, it'll list the names, and then it will create a file called featureName.diff, which has the differences for each of those. So you can go and inspect them. Uh, this should, when you, when you um, uh, on your production server, this should always return nothing. Uh, if you spin up a local copy of the production server without any changes, it should, without any local changes, it should also return nothing. Uh, you could add this to something like this to an automated test somewhere if you wanted to be uh, careful about it. Uh, Drupal 8, I already mentioned um, the equivalent to those feature import export commands are drush config export, drush config import. Um, so, as anyone, I, I don't personally use uh, uh, GUIs to deal with Git, but uh, when you do, you sometimes see uh, diagrams like this. Does this look familiar, anyone? Yeah, I see a few nods. Um, so now, those are, those are just best practices, so prerequisites for getting into these Git branching strategies that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to present uh, three in order from simplest to most, most complex, so that each, uh, they'll build on the previous steps. Um, uh, and this, the one you choose depends on the size of your project and your team, uh, how, how hard your, um, how many steps there are in your QA process. Uh, and my main source for this is, uh, again, a tutorial from Atlassian. Uh, the URL is right here if you want to go read more about this later. So first, centralized workflow. This is the first, Git, the first workflow that you'd start using if you've never seen uh, Git before. There are no branches, there's no merging, there's no conflicts. You, there's just one developer uh, working on uh, uh, the site or on each component of the site. Uh, so every time you do a change, you just uh, type git add and git commit and uh, all work is done on one master branch. It's a very, very simple method, uh, but it doesn't scale. Feature branches. Feature branches are what you often see on GitHub. Um, so here you have uh, multiple people uh, working on the code base. Uh, one, one person or responsible for testing and improving and uh, those, uh, those changes, also called pull requests, or at least one person responsible for each section. For example, um, Drupal itself has um, there's a maintainer's file which uh, lists who's responsible for the different um, components of Drupal core, and that's the person who will uh, decide if a, uh, a patch is, is accepted. Um, uh, the Linux kernel works the same way. There's, um, I can't remember the name of the shell script, but there's a, um, uh, there's a file that has a list of, there's actually like regular expressions that says like this, this path in the core is the responsibility of this person. And so you run, when you want to work on one file, you run this script and it'll look at those regexes and it'll say, okay, send your patch to this person. It's a very long file. Uh, Drupal is a little simpler that way. So this is, this is a perfectly workable method. Um, you have, uh, so every new feature is a new branch. So you create a new branch, which is merged off of the master branch. Uh, when you think it's ready, you send a pull request. Uh, while you're working on the dev branch, other things have been fixed, and so you need to keep merging master back into your um, uh, dev branch so that it keeps up, you keep up to date with all those changes. Um, so you can do a fast forward only merge, uh, as it's called in, in Git. And then the maintainer uh, will look at those changes and they will merge uh, the, that feature into, into master. And then every once in a while, that, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, maintainer, the, the centralized position, will uh, tag a commit and say, okay, now this is version, version eight, or now this is version nine, or, or whatever. 
Um, and GitHub and GitLab have nice UIs where you actually see a button saying, this, isn't, this is ready to be committed because uh, it's up to date with the latest version of master, or it's not. Um, it's, a, it's a nice UI. Here's a little squiggly diagram to explain feature branches. So um, in the top one, you see there's a, a master branch, uh, and two feature branches have come off of it. Uh, in the bottom one, you see uh, another master branch uh, so somebody has made uh, a development branch and it's been a pull request happened and it got merged back into the master branch. So in the bottom one, the dot furthest to the right contains all the commits on the dev branch, which is the one underneath, as well as the one on the, the main line, that, uh, that white one. So in this case, there were no, um, there are no merge conflicts. They didn't need to merge master back in. Um, does that make sense so far? Yeah? Who here is using uh, something that resembles this to manage Git branches? Okay, about half of you? Okay. Great. Here's the main problem with that. Let's say five different people are adding features. Uh, each of them work individually, but nobody ever tested them all together. And then you get, uh, then you find out why integration tests are useful. Each of these drawers opens, but you can't open, but once you put them both there, they become pretty useless. Here's one more description uh, example of why an integration test is useful. So here we have a paper uh, towel dispenser and a garbage can. Oops, no, how do I, how do I make this? Yeah, here we go. <laughs> so two features which work by themselves but don't work together. So uh, here's a way we can solve that. This is, so this is the git flow workflow. Um, so this is, is builds on a feature, feature branching model. Uh, it's essentially a naming convention. So there's no, th there is actually um, like a git uh, extension you can, you can download that like tries to simplify this, but it, it's, it's just a naming convention for different branches. So you have s branches with specific names and a specific process for when you merge what into what. Um, it's, it's, it's just basic git commands. Uh, this works, and I found this works very well for a team with multiple developers using an agile process, as I was described very, uh, very rapidly uh, uh, earlier in the talk. And this allows you to have an integration test and a review of all the features in a branch uh, before you do a release. Um, it allows you to uh, remove a feature from that, rele from that uh, release if it's not ready, and, uh, and there's still a way to do a hotfix directly on prod uh, if some crisis comes up uh, and your boss is really unhappy about it. Okay, so next squiggly diagram. I'm going to spend a bit more time on this one. Uh, so these are color coded. Um, for the sake of other colorblind people like myself, I'll describe them. The top one here is your master branch, and you see there these things here are your tags, uh, telling you um, what uh, what version we're looking at. So here, this is the this dot right here is a hotfix. So that hotfix, uh, that's a branch that was, merged, that was created directly off of the master branch. Um, some, fix, some minor little fix was made, and then it was merged back here into version 0 0.2, and that was, that's the hotfix being deployed. So that's, that, right there, that looks like, a, like, feature, like the feature branch model that we discussed earlier. Um, the, the git flow model, however, has more branches. So down here, this, this long, long one here is the develop branch. Um, I would often just call that dev. Uh, so this was initially forked off the master branch. And this, this doesn't go away. This, doesn't, this branch, we, uh, like the hotfix branch, once it's merged into master, uh, you can delete that branch. Uh, git has a command. When you list, the command to list git branches has a flag, a dash dash merge, where you can see just the branches that are already merged into the current branch. That tells you the branches that you can delete because they're no longer necessary because all of their commits are included on the branch you're currently on. So the, I would, I get after, as soon as you've merged one of these branches in, then I would immediately delete it so, you don't, so you've got less clutter. Uh, but the develop branch or the dev branch, you leave. That, that stays there. So what you do, um, is uh, so for example here at the very bottom uh, a dev branch has been uh, uh, like has been created from the from the 
a feature branch has been created from the dev branch. So here, in this case, somebody has been working on it and they've made four commits. Um, here is another feature branch, this one down here. Uh, so it was forked off of the, um, uh, the develop branch and then has been merged back in here to the develop branch. Uh, the hotfix branch here, in addition to being merged into master, had to get merged into the develop branch. So those, that change, that urgent fix, is in both places. And so once you've merged from hotfix into dev, then if you, if you merge dev back into your feature branch, you're going to have that hotfix commit on your branch as well. And your feature branches should always be up, up to date with the latest version of the, the dev branch, which in turn will always be up to date, will include all the commits from the latest version of the master branch. The interesting thing, the, the integration test part that I promised, is here. So this is a release branch. So you could call this like a release slash 10, or uh, if, it's, if it's your 10th sprint, for example. Um, so that was, that was forked off of the dev branch and will be merged into the master branch. But here is where you take a bunch of tickets, everything you close in your sprint, and you spin up an instance of the site uh, that, that contains all of these tickets, and that's where you, where you do user acceptance testing. Your product owner, your client, I'm guessing don't want to go look at 10 different sites and test 10, to, 10, to test 10 different features. And besides, if they did that, they, that, that doesn't count as an integration test. So every two weeks, you give them one site, and you make sure that all of the 10 things you fixed work on that, um, on that uh, release branch. And when that's been accepted, then you merge that into master, and that's when you get version 1.0 here. Uh, and then that, here you see there's two commits on this uh, release branch, so some little fix had to happen just on that right before, um, right before deployment. Uh, so it was merged back into the develop branch, so that way you make sure the develop branch always has all the, the commits from the master branch, so it's further ahead. Um, I'm going to show you the specific git commands you could run to do each of those steps in a, in a minute, so I'm, I'm getting there. But does this, on a general conceptual level, um, I just showed you a whole lot of little dots on a big squiggly diagram. Does that generally make sense, the, the concept? Because if not, I'll take more time now. Yeah? Oh, question? Uh, I'm just wondering, you said earlier, normally you delete the branch for the hot fix, right? So how about yeah. the one for the release? Are you only keeping two branches, basically the master and the develop one? Yeah, so okay. the, the question was, um, I, I said to delete the hot fix branch. Um, so would I also delete the uh, release branch here? Okay. Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, also, all of the feature branches, as soon as they're merged in, I would delete them. So, um, uh, yeah, and I'll, uh, yeah. So, and as I mentioned, you can type git branch dash dash merged. So, if you check out the dev branch and then run git branch dash dash merged, you'll get a list of all the branches that have been merged in. All of the commits are included, so you can get rid of them. You can delete those branches locally and on your upstream uh, git server. Uh, and then you can do the same thing for master. This is just. It's not useful to keep them around. If you need to reopen that ticket, then just fork that branch off again. Um, so now some Git best practices. Uh, I already mentioned uh, I strongly suggest keeping the uh, ticket number um, uh, in, the, uh, in the commit message as well as in the branch name. Uh, so for example, in Redmine, if you have, uh, we use uh, Gitosis to uh, uh, integrate Redmine and Git. So uh, if you type uh, refs number sign 123, then when you're looking at ticket 123, um, uh, you'll see a list uh, of links to all of the commits that were made against that ticket. So you, it helps you figure out later which, uh, like when you're looking at your issue tracker, you can immediately see a list, like a list of all the commits that, that uh, are related to that ticket, and you click on them and you see the diff. So that, that helps a lot. And when you're looking at the Git log, you can search through it to find um, all of the tickets that were related to a specific, um, the commits that were related to a specific ticket. Um, uh, I mentioned that um, uh, I, uh, when you were merging, the, um, merging a hotfix or a release branch into master or dev, uh, you need to, if you have a, um, uh, if this is a fast forward only merge, Git will not normally create a new commit. 
um, because it's not necessary, but I would strongly suggest that you do that um, using the no fast forward uh, option. You can do this, you can configure that, you can do that on the command line, you can uh, configure that in your .git config file. Um, so that, that way you'll see an extra commit just for the action of taking that dev branch, sorry, taking that release branch and putting it into the master branch. And why you do that, uh, I'll, I'll, um, the advantage of that I'll get to in a minute. So yeah, anytime you, you merge a hotfix, a release, or a, um, a feature branch into master or the develop branch, I s suggest you create a, a commit, uh, a merge commit just for that. Um, I'd also strongly suggest you use git prompt.sh. That's a shell script which is distributed with the source code of git itself, so you can find it very easily on GitHub or anywhere else. And it lets you do little things like, at minimum, print the name of the, of the branch that you're on right in your, get, in your bash prompt. Um, this is a lifesaver. You can also have it print fancier things like whether there are uncommitted changes and other stuff. That, that'll start to slow th things down a bit. But at minimum, you, you always want to know what git, you, sh you, should, you should always know what git branch you're on. So put it right in your prompt. Um, naming conventions. Uh, yeah, so I, I mentioned these briefly already. Uh, so master, that's what production runs. So production always has the latest version of this of this branch. Dev, that's the one. Uh, that is the other one that I said doesn't go away. That's the one where you collect all of the feature branches. Um, dev one two three or feature one two three is the is the tick is the uh, branch corresponding to ticket number one two three. And those are mer those are branched off of dev and will be merged back into dev. Release slash number. Um, is the set of is a snapshot of the dev branch at a specific time with all the tickets that have been completed. Um, that is uh, merged off of dev and will be merged into master and deleted once it's done. Hotfix ticket number um, is merged off of master and will be merged back into master when it's complete. And again, all those ones with numbers in them, all of them I would delete as soon as they've been merged into one of the two branches that stick around. Uh, now I'm going to show you my two favorite all-time git commands. I run these dozens of times every day. So the first one, this updates all local copies from all, rem from all your git remotes um, uh, to sh showing you a list of all of the branches and all of these uh, different origins. Um, uh, the dash dash, so, git, so it, doesn't, it doesn't do a git pull. It just brings in copies of the commits to locally so that you can look at them later and figure out what the differences are. So that's that's a, that's what. So git fetch will will download the file, the, the changes, but not apply them. The dash dash all will do it across all uh, um, all remotes, and the dash dash prune will delete will will delete the, the local the local copy of a remote branch which has been deleted uh, from your origin. So because you don't need them anymore. Uh, command number two. Uh, this will list all of the local and the remote branches. It will show you the uh, the current hash point. It'll show you the, it'll show you for each local branch which remote branch it's tracking, because your local branches should always be tracking something upstream. Uh, it will show you the commit subject line. Um, so git branch dash all dash vv. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, dash dash merged or no or uh, dash dash no merged will help you figure out which branches have been merged in and which ones still need to be merged in. And that should correspond to whether or not the ticket in your issue tracker is closed or not. Um, here's a sample output of uh, favorite command number one. So here uh, I'm fetching from origin. Uh, you can see it deleted my local copy of one of the branches because it was removed. Um, counting objects, compressing objects here. It's downloading the files, uh, and it's showing me what's, uh, what's changed. Uh, favorite command number two. Um, here you can see, so, the, so um, I'm running git branch um, dash dash all dash vv. Uh, the, there's one line that's in bold with an asterisk beside it. That's the current branch, although I already knew that because it's in my, my bash prompt. Um, it's listing the uh, it's listing uh, for other local branches and which remote they're tracking and whether they're ahead or behind or both. Uh, 
then after that, it's listing all of the branches uh, on origin so that I can, I can see um, what state they're in there. Or if there's a new branch uh, that I don't have a copy of, for example. Um, now here's the part, uh, so this is how we go from the squiggly diagram to something you tap on the command line. Uh, here's how you would create a new feature. So this you would do in the feature branching model too. So on your local machine, uh, you would check out the dev branch. Um, uh, you would, uh, and then you would create a new, uh, well yeah, I guess you'd do git pull uh, here in between these two, first two steps. And then you'd create a new branch that's forked off of dev called dev slash one, two, three. Uh, then as you're working on it, once you would periodically do git merge dev to bring in changes from other people or from other tickets into your branch to make sure it stays up to date. Uh, and then when you're ready, you would push it to, uh, you push it to origin uh, for review. So that's simple enough. Um, then if you're the scrum master and you're reviewing one of these, you would fetch the branch uh, uh, from, uh, from origin uh, you would mer I would type git merge dev to make sure that it's up to date, and then I do git diff dev to see all of the changes between this feature branch and dev. So now that's showing me everything that the person changed, that the developer on my team changed. When I think it's ready, then I would check out dev again, and I would merge that into dev. Then after that, I would delete uh, the local and remote copies of this branch because they're no longer necessary. Again, these slides, are, these slides are online. I'll give you the URL another time. So pictures are great. No, no, please take pictures. That's very flattering. But uh, you can look at the slides later and copy paste uh, uh, as well. Oh, what's the dash T option? I'm sorry? Uh, dash T option. Dash T? Oh, that's, that, um, that checks it out and uh, sets, it, sets that branch to, that checks out a local copy which will track origin. So it sort of has a, it knows like, yeah, in this, in this slide, the part where in the local branches are tracking something on origin in, in the brackets, that's how it sets that up. There's different commands you can use to do that. Um, this, this, this one will work. Uh, you can see, if you look at the .git slash config file, it'll tell you really clearly which branches are tracking something on origin. And normally, normally the local branch and the, re and the remote, and the name on the origin uh, uh, on the remote would be the same. Although that you know. might be set up the default. So uh, you can check out branch names to get that, right? Um, yeah, it, it depends. I think that's the default if you only have one origin. But often I'm working with multiple origins. But yeah, like if, you have to, if, you, if you were just to get check out dev123, if you don't have a dev123, it will check out the origin copy of that. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. If you do git checkout dev slash one two three, and there's only one branch with that name on 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 an origin, it will check it out with a local name and make sure make it a tracking branch. Yeah. Um, okay. So now we've created a feature branch. We've accepted it and merged it back into dev. And now we need to uh, let's say we did that for five other branches. Now we're ready to prepare a release branch and do integration testing. Um, so we would uh, make a new branch forked off, um, forked off of dev uh, in the usual way, git branch dash b is the branch name. We would push that to origin. Then on our, our staging environment, which is where our, our um, user acceptance testing is going to happen, uh, at some point in here, you'd sync the database from production. Uh, you would uh, check that out. Um, and then you'd run whatever the deployment steps are. So uh, feature revert all, um, drush up db, etc. Whatever, whatever you're. So now we're referring back to the best practices I referred to earlier. You've got some. You had. You had. Somehow you had put into code a way to run those deployment steps. This is where you run them. And you're testing the deployment steps, which you will later be running on production as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's probably obvious, but I don't see it anyway. Um, when do you need to go origin four slash versus origin space? Versus origin space? Oh, um, uh, yeah. So git push here. I'm I'm saying to, to push to the origin the local branch with this name. Uh, um, if it's origin slash, that means you're referring to a remote branch. Yeah. When there's release four is a local branch. And it's simply saying, or 
origin is the place I want it to be pushed to. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Because yeah. there, there is. Yeah, in this, in this line here, this line number three, there is no branch called origin slash release slash zero four, because we're, it exists locally, and so we're creating it on origin. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, so now we're ready, so now we've created our uh, release branch, and it's set up on a staging server. We've run our deployment steps, which were all in code, and some, some user acceptance testing has happened, and everyone thinks it's great, so now we're going to deploy it. On, on production. So on production, uh, sorry, on, the lo on a local machine, we'll merge that release branch into master, and we'll create a tag, and then push that with the tags. Uh, and you'll notice the, we, the dash, dash no FF, no fast forward. Uh, so that created a merge commit um, uh, for, for that action of merging the, the branch. Uh, then on, so now all of the changes from that release branch are on the master branch, and all we need to do uh, on production, which always stays on the master branch, is type git pull, and then run the deployment steps. And we've already tested these. We've not only tested the code, but we've tested the deployment process and those, those scripted deployment steps themselves, so we know that they work. And so we can do this in full confidence. We're still not gonna do it Friday afternoon because we're not crazy, but we, we're pretty sure it's gonna work. Okay, does this make sense so far? Yeah, okay. Um, and then something terrible goes wrong, and there's a catastrophe. Uh, so we need to create a hotfix branch. So this is similar to those previous steps. So here's on, this, these are the steps we'd run on uh, our local machine. So we'd make a new branch, as I said earlier, branch directly off of master. This is called hotfix slash ticket number. We do, we do, we'd fix our code, we'd write our tests, um, and these would include the deployment steps, whatever they are. Uh, then when, once that's ready, you check out master, merge the hotfix into it, uh, push in, uh, create an, a new tag, and push that to uh, so this git push will go right to master because that's the branch we're on. And then we just need to deploy on, on production the same way we deployed, uh, the, same way we deployed the, the feature branch. So uh, um, let's see. Now I'm going to talk briefly about reserve, resolving merge conflicts. Who here has had to re do a really ugly uh, uh, merge conflict? Like fix that. Everybody, yes. So um, you've all had to do it, you're all experts. Um, I'll just mention really briefly uh, <laughs> some, some tips for this. Uh, yeah, so try to create small distinct tickets. Um, keep the scope small and then you'll avoid overlapping. Uh, like having two people work on the same thing at once, and then you're less likely to get into a conflict. Um, uh, merge the, the parent branch, so probably, which is probably dev, back into your feature branch um, uh, frequently, so that way like five little merges are much easier to do than one huge one. Uh, get, uh, when you're doing a, if you get, do get a conflict, um, get status will list all the files with conflicts and let you, um, uh, so that you can edit each of them. Uh, when you're editing them, you search for a whole bunch of less thans in your editor and you'll see the beginning of uh, the section with problems, so you can fix that manually. Uh, there are also, uh, if you're using an editor that lets you do a three-way merge, or personally I use Vim, for example, uh, you can configure that um, git merge tool dash dash tool dash help will list the editors that are known to support three-way merges that are supported on your, your platform, whatever your local environment is. Um, so go figure out what those are and figure, learn how to use one of them. Uh, something very helpful I found, if you ever get stuck halfway through a merge and it's just really not going well, git merge dash dash abort will just like completely back, will back up to before you were doing the merge. Um, so for example, if, if I'm, if I'm the scrum master and I'm trying to merge a few things together in one ticket I'm having a lot of problems with, and I, I can't get it and I'm not really sure what the person was doing because it's because um, I didn't work on the ticket, I would abort the merge and then I would say to that developer, hey, please merge dev back into your feature branch because I can't figure out what you're doing. I want you to do that and test it and then uh, tell me when it's ready. So that helps a lot. Um, yeah. Uh, remove, so now, now the uh, uh, a tricky part, 
I mentioned being able to remove one ticket from a release. So you've got, you, you finished 10 features in your sprint, user acceptance testing showed that one of them had a problem. So here's how you do that. Um, first step, you, uh, um, you revert to the merge. Actually, yeah, this should be, uh, sorry, this should be a checkout um, release slash X. Uh, but you revert the merge that brought in the feature branch. So when I mentioned earlier that, that you should create, do a non-fast forward merge and create a, a separate commit for the merge itself, right here, this is why. Because that lets you undo that action later. Um, if you don't do that, you won't have a way to do it. So you would remove, the, you would revert the merge itself from, sorry, it should be from your uh, uh, release, uh, from your release branch. So you'll have to do git log and figure out which commit it is. Then um, you'd, uh, 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 you need to, um, so then, then you have a, a release branch that doesn't have the problematic um, uh, feature branch. Once, so now you've got just nine tickets and they've, they've all worked, and so you, you've got something ready to deploy. But you still need to fix that problematic 10th ticket. So now what you do is you, um, uh, uh, well, yeah, it's, I've, I've missed a couple steps here. You, what you would do is you'd merge that release branch back into dev, then you'd merge dev back into your uh, feature branch. So, um, so, so yeah, here I'm checking out the feature branch and merging dev back into it. And then what you do is revert the, oops, sorry, revert the revert. So you would undo the action of undoing the, uh, the merge. So that, what that takes you to is a point that you, uh, that takes you back to a point where the, where the, um, on your feature branch where you have the, have the code again. So you're back to the point right before you merged into, into dev. So now you've got your half-baked feature and it's, you're on that branch again and you can fix it, do whatever edits are necessary, um, uh, and then uh, tr hopefully commit it in the next sprint. Is that, that's a, I think that's the trickiest git command I was planning to show you. Does that make sense at least in principle? Okay, great. That was the hardest one for me to get my head around. Um, uh, so you're all, you're all doing great. Um, further reading. So um, this talk started life as, well, yeah, I had my own personal text file listing all the tricky git commands I was learning. Uh, at one point I created a gist and then I started adding a bunch of notes to make that readable. And that was, that, that was version one of something that became the slides of this talk. Uh, so I have a link to that here. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, that Atlassian has some really good tutorials. So here's, they have, in addition to the one which is just an introduction to Git, um, and the one comparing Git workflows, where, which is my main source for learning all this, they have one uh, that talks about the difference between merging and rebasing, uh, which is out of scope for this talk because we're already at 50 minutes, but um, uh, is, is another good Git tool to learn. Um, and there's a, here's a, I've also put in a link to uh, how to resolve conflicts. Um, I'll just show you this very quickly. It looks like, yeah. So, well, I don't expect anyone to actually be able to read this, but uh, um, this is the long version of exactly the material I was presenting now, but with more text. So if you want to sit down and read this at home, uh, I would, uh, or share it with your colleagues, um, uh, you could go there. Um, yeah. Uh, right before I take questions, I'll just mention that uh, my company, Evolving Web, offers a lot of training, uh, including on module development. Um, uh, so there's some coming up next week online, and uh, short, a little later in, uh, in September here locally in Ottawa, if that's of interest to anyone. So site building, theming, module development. These are all Drupal 8 specific, uh, by the way. And there's many more trainings that are offered in, and in other cities uh, which are listed on this, this uh, URL. Um, and now uh, I will take questions or uh, stories of terrible Git merges you've had to deal with um, or anything else you want to share. Uh, this, uh, this link down here again is a link to this, uh, these slides and the videos from this talk and all the other talks of this camp are available at this URL here. So. Uh, questions?
Is there any strategy to this sort of workflow for dealing with tickets that depend on other tickets? <laughs> yeah, so like ticket, yeah, so I mean you just have to, so yeah, ticket one uh, depend, like can't be worked in until ticket two is finished. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean you've got to, you, you just have to know that, so you can't even work on ticket one until ticket two is, is done, right? So the ticket two has to be done and, and, ex and uh, committed to dev uh, before you can even start working on ticket one. And if you think it's a big user, vi use, user visible change, then you need to do user acceptance testing and actually commit that to master and like, like get it approved by all the stakeholders that need to uh, approve it and then work on the other ticket in the next sprint. I mean, uh, yeah, if it's, if it's two smaller things, hopefully you can do them in the same sprint and just like, you know, you just have to know in your team, oh yeah, let's make sure to finish this one like by Tuesday so that, so that uh, uh, Sue can start this other one on Wednesday or, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's just part of the job of being a scrum master, I guess. Yeah. yeah I suppose it's like a good merge between feature branches. Oh, it yes. needed to, to sort of develop two things in parallel. Yeah. Um, yes, I've done that. I've, um, uh, like, let's say, yeah, I've, I've, had, to, I've had to do that if, a, if, a, if one feature is uh, mostly done but not completely done, and then you want to work on some other feature which builds on it and only needs, and the parts that are done are finished enough for that, then yeah, you, would, you could branch that off of the one feature branch off of another feature branch. Um, and then you'd have, then um, once the first one was merged into dev, like all those commits would be there, so the second one you'd be able to merge back into dev uh, directly. So that gets a little trickier, but yeah, you, you can do that. Um, or sometimes, I mean, it's, I guess it's, it's a little messy, but sometimes like you've, I've, uh, like I've had like two developers work on one on the same branch because they're working on things that need to go together, like say the front end part and the back end part or something. So you might have two tickets, but it's actually on one branch. So there I would just say in the deployment notes to put a really big obvious note saying this, is, this work is being done on branch whatever if it's not the obvious one. Like if ticket five is being worked on on dev slash four, then just like say that really clearly so that when you go to deploy, you know what branch to, to do it on. Yeah. Um, Isn't it better to actually, because the way you have that workflow is when you have two tickets, mm -hmm. should you just make two branches? Because it's going to get, I mean, of course you said like you can have that node and everything, but it yeah. can get them to take two, right? No, or, yeah, I'm, I mean, it's cleaner to have two separate branches when you've got two tickets. You're right. But the, the question was, no. what, do, what do you do when you're working on, the feature I'm working on requires something you're working on yeah. in the same sprint. So then, yeah, like you can merge the commits from one branch into, one feature branch into yours or, or do something like that. So, that, I mean, if, you're, uh, if your team is comf comfortable enough with, uh, with Git then, and you're organized enough to do that. But, I mean, that's the exception. You shouldn't have to do that too often. Um, if you do, maybe you should have split something into smaller tickets. Yeah. It's a very good uh, point to raise, uh, branching off the feature branch, or branching, kind of branch you're working on. Yeah. I did that in a recent project and got my hands stuck. That's because I really sort of were making changes, so if yeah. something kind of on my mind, I branch off and see if I can make it work. Yeah. Um, so the, the reason I was given was that, you know, branches are cheap, why keep going off one off the other? Mm -hmm. Something get rid of it and bring another one. So um, I guess it's not a typical case for you that you're doing this, or is it one off, or is it a general practice? No, we not the Okay. Yeah. I've, yeah, I've, uh, yeah, so I've, I've done it occasionally, like, I'd say it, like, in my experience, it's something I've done, like, maybe, like, once every three or four sprints, like, it'll come up. So, but yeah, it's, I'd say it's usually a sign that you probably should have made smaller tickets, but sometimes that's, that's hard to do. Yeah. Or maybe have one ticket with two sub-tickets. One ticket with two sub-tickets, yes. You can, in your issue tracker, like, like Jira and Redmine both let you say, like, this ticket is blocking this other one, or this is a sub-ticket of this other one. So then you know to work on the sub-tickets before you work on the, the main one. Yeah. Um, yeah, how you organize that kind of thing in, a, um, uh, in your ticket tracker. I mean, you'll, you'll find something that works for your team. Um, other questions? I don't see any more hands. Thank you very much. Thank you.